Hello, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to this week's edition of the Nebar MMA Podcast. We will jump into our UFC 192 coverage very shortly. I'm Johnny Brown alongside Nolan King. How you doing today, Nolan? I'm doing pretty well, man. Some great fights last weekend. I can't wait to get into it. Uh, some fight announcements, uh, all types of stuff. Bellator, WSOF, UFC. I'm yeah, let's just jump into it. Now let's take a look back at this past weekend's big event, UFC 182, Nolan. Interesting night of fights. Uh, the, the main event really delivered. I think a lot of people were skeptical of it, but it was a great night of fights. Let's start off from the very bottom. The first fight of the night, Derek Lewis versus Victor Pesta. Derek Lewis battled back from adversity. I think he definitely lost the first round. He came back, almost finished the fight in the second round. Um, probably won that one, so it was 19-19 on Mike scorecard going to the third, and he really pulled it off. Victor Pesta looked really damaged from that second round, but uh, a statement win for Lewis. Uh, you know that, in my opinion, that means uh, he he's he's planning on sticking around the UFC, not not wanting to get cut or anything like that. Yeah, I agree. I you know this was a very um, telling fight for Lewis. I feel like I can get a better gauge on how good he is. Um, he was a guy that kind of. Uh, beat everybody that he should have beaten and then lost to the guys uh, that are a little step up from from the prelim, uh, you know, mid-tier heavyweights. Uh, I think Victor Pest is, uh, you know, one of the few heavyweight prospects in that division. And, and uh, besides that first round, you know, Lewis handled him pretty well. Uh, Derek is definitely one of the last heavyweights that I would want to have um, if I was a fighter on top of me. Uh, I think his ground and pound from the top is, is some of the best in the division. I'm not just saying that. Um, I, I think, you know, once he gets going, uh, unleashing bombs, it is not going to end up well for whoever's on the bottom. Yeah, I was kind of shocked when he was on top throwing those bombs. You know, he would have dominant position, but he didn't, you know, he, for a heavyweight, he didn't seem that gassed after throwing so many bombs. You know, I figured he might really slow down, but he, he threw enough volume to uh, get the stoppage for sure. Yeah, and I, I agree with that. Like, I, I was really surprised by his cardio. I thought Pesta, you know, being more of a ground-oriented fighter would have a better cardio than Lewis, but that proved not to be the case. And actually, you know, I actually liked what I saw, you know, from Lewis off the off his back. Even I know he kind of was getting controlled in that first round, but at one point he used a, um, you know, a Kimura. Um, you know, it was never really a threat for submission, but he used it to try to get up. Um, certain things like that. Uh, we saw that in the Jack May fight in his UFC debut. He was able to reverse things and, um, you, you know, from the ground. So I think he's a pretty well-rounded heavyweight. Uh, hopefully the UFC can pick up more guys like this. I know we've talked about this in the past. They need more of these mid-tier heavyweights. Um, you know, they need. They need to the, fill the gap between um, Junior Dos Santos and a uh, guy that goes 0-2 that's, you know, kind of out of shape and they cut him. Um, they need to get more of these middle ground guys. Yeah, I absolutely agree. And the next fight was on the oppo- opposite um, side of the scale, flyweight, Sergio Pettis, Chris Carriasso. Carriasso, obviously the more seasoned fighter. Um, Sergio Pettis uh, came in there and, and did a pretty good job. He uh, knocked Carriasso down in the first, and uh, I think he won two rounds for sure. Um, Chris Carriasso kind of started strong in that third. He had, had him in a, um, like a, a couple of submission holds. I, I don't remember exactly uh, what, what, but I definitely remember he won the third round. Um, a little too late, though, Sergio Pettis with really impressive uh, comeback after getting knocked out. Yeah, I agree. I, you know, that I thought Pettis, despite getting getting caught by um, Ryan Benoit in the first fight, uh, you know, I thought that he showed a good improvement. Um, you know, I think he's more fluid and, and just it's, it's more natural for him to be at 125. I'm not really sure why they started him at 135. Um, you know, he was a 125 or his whole career up until his debut in the UFC. Uh, yeah, man, I think that, you know, this it's pretty evident to me that, that he's a, he's a real the real deal. And um you know, I think he's got to get a couple more fights under his belt before he starts, like, contending or anything like that. But he's definitely got the tools. Um, you know, Carriasso, I know, is kind of on the decline. But I think that he's still a top 15 uh, flyweight. And he's a veteran. He's a guy that's fought some tough, tough dudes. And, um, you know, if Pettis can, um, you know, keep improving and, uh, you know, he slacked off a little bit in the third round there, I thought. I thought Carriasso won that round. Uh, you know, to sharpen up his holes, the holes in his game, he's still so young. Uh, I think he's, you know, a, a guy that that division can use, uh, you know, at, at a time where it's kind of getting weaker and weaker. Yeah, absolutely. And the next uh, next fight was actually on the fight pass prelims. It was the headliner, but it actually got played on the uh, Fox Sports 1 portion of the card. 
Sage Northcutt, the debut everyone's talking about, ran through Francisco Trevino in 57 seconds. Uh, this was an interesting fight. Trevino kind of slipped, and Sage Northcutt didn't give him any slack and uh, finished him. Uh, Trevino was very upset. I, I don't think, you know, I think he was going to be out pretty soon. I don't know if he was fully out, but I think it was a good stoppage. And Trevino, you know, after the fight, kind of pushed the ref a little bit. And uh, that, in my opinion, might get him cut. Plus, he missed weight at 160 pounds, uh, 5 pounds uh, north of the 155-pound uh, limit. Um, so I think this is a pretty bad night for Trevino, but I can't say enough about Sage Northcutt. Um, do you believe the hype, Nolan? Is this the guy legit? Yeah, I mean, for sure. I think that, um, you know, I think the hype that he's earning right now is, is, um, is warranted, but I think, you know, we can't get, we, we should see him fight a couple more times before we start saying he's going to be the next champion. I just think that we need to see a uh, step up in competition, um, you know, have him fight somebody that that is, um, you know, a couple steps up from Trevino. I think he's kind of at the bottom of the uh, the, the bin in that division. No, no offense to him, um, but he's in the UFC, and in my opinion, Trevino is a guy that earned his way to the UFC. He has the UFC win on his record. Um, he's fought some tough guys, twelve and one, and for Northcutt to come out and just completely starch him like that was was great, um, or not great, but it was it was it was unbelievable in my opinion. Um, and and for him to be so young, I, you know, he's probably he's one of the few. Uh, fighters on the UFC roster that's younger than me. I feel so weird watching this guy who's two years younger than me, uh, you know, competing at that level, um, doing crazy ass backflips makes me wonder what I'm doing with my life. But um, yeah, man, I, I think the, the stoppage, I do want to comment on a little bit. I, I thought that it was kind of, um, it wasn't a bad stoppage, but watching it on the replay, I think there were a significant amount of shots to the back of the head. Uh, and I also think that a lot of them were hitting his, his, his shoulders. Um, with that being said, Trevino was, was hurt. He was in a lot of trouble, and I don't think that fight would have ended any other way. I don't think it would have lasted a minute longer if he let it continue. Um, but, uh, you know, no matter how mad Trevino can can get, you should never lay your hands on the referee. And, and if the UFC wants to stay con consistent, um, you know, I, I think he'll get the um, – the pink slip yeah man trust me i had a couple years on you and never never stops feeling weird man it feels very bizarre <laughs> for me um regardless uh, as the age he definitely impressed the sage with cut going on to our fox sports one card portion of the card i should say rose nama Yunez, angela hill kind of went how we expected i believe um nama Yunez pulled off a great uh standing rear naked choke about two minutes and 47 seconds into the first round um, again, I wasn't the biggest fan of this match as far as, uh, I know they both don't have a lot of experience, so it's kind of, uh, you know, both two guys, uh, both two ladies, excuse me, trying to, uh, you know, kind of make their mark, get some experience, but, uh, I thought Angela Hill was over, in, in over her head, and, uh, Nami Yunus picking up that beautiful submission, and, uh, uh, what'd you think about that one, uh, yeah, I mean, I, like you said, uh, it was kind of not a good matchup in my opinion. I think that the women's uh, strawweight division kind of has these weird mismatches where um, when you hear the fight announcement, you kind of think, oh, that's not that much of a mismatch. Um, but they don't seem to really go by the rankings. I mean, we just saw Paige Van Zandt take on Alex Chambers, um, you know, another kind of similar matchup. Uh, Rose and, and Angela are both pretty inexperienced fighters, but when it comes to talent, uh, Rose has fought, you know, a, a lot more ta uh, better talented uh excuse me, a better level of talent. And at the same time as, you know, uh, improve leaps and bounds throughout her career. Uh, Hill's still, you know, kind of a work in progress. She's kind of one dimensional. Um, she's obviously very athletic. Um, she's got some good stuff that she can improve on, but I think Rose was the better fighter coming in and it really showed in that fight. Um, and, you know, she definitely deserves a step up in competition after that. Yeah, the next bout was a fight I was super excited about and it delivered a short bout, but a minute and 46 seconds into the fight, Adriano Martins versus Islam, Islam Makachev. Martins with that beautiful punch. Uh, Makachev was kind of going there, like, kind of swinging a little wildly, and Martins made him pay. And uh, made, uh, made him pay. And uh, I don't think there's a, a more underrated fighter in the lightweight division than Adriano Martins. What do you think about that, Nolan? Yeah, I agree. I mean, I you know looking at it uh, in retrospective, at the time the fight was announced, I loved it. Looking at it in retrospect, I think that like you said, Adriano Martins is one of the most underappreciated fight fighters in that division. Uh, if not the most underappreciated fighter. Um, but looking back on it, you know, M Makachev, 1-0 in the UFC. Um, I was kind of surprised that they gave him Martins. Uh, I thought he's, you know, I'm not, I'm never a fan of them protecting prospects, so to say, but at the same time, I don't think necessarily throwing a guy in there against a pretty experienced vet who is 4-1 in the UFC, um, or 3-1, I'm not, I'm, I can't quite remember what Martins is, but 
necessarily makes the most sense. Um, but that was, you know, that was extremely impressive by Martins to finish a guy in that fashion who had never been defeated before. It was supposed to be the, the next big thing out of Russia. Uh, just puts him away, you know, lightning fast. Martins has to get a step up in competition um, from here. I, I think he's one fight away from being in the in those rankings, which at the lightweight division is pretty impressive to, when you crack the top 15. Yeah, there seems to be a, a, a lot of uh, fighters from Russia that come out of the uh, their Russian circuit undefeated. Uh, Makachev is one of them. And, uh, you know, Makachev is a great fighter, don't get me wrong, but it seems like only a couple of those guys continue the success. And I'm not saying the Russian, uh, you know, circuits are weak or anything. It just seems like uh, a lot of guys come out there undefeated, and we kind of see once they at the UFC level where their careers are actually going to project. Obviously, you got Nurmaga Nirma- Madoff, who's uh, doing great things, and you got some, uh, you know, Makachev. And, and so I'm not, no, not diss against him, but it just seems kind of like the. Uh, I don't know if you see that trend or not, but it seems a lot of guys come out of that circuit undefeated. Yeah, I, I think that a big part of that too is that I think WSOF is is snatching up a good amount of the, um, you know, the top the the um, the middle, I'll say middle tier Russian prospects, uh, you know, importees into the, the um, American MMA scene. Uh, you know, you obviously have, like you said, the Nurmagomedovs, the Bagautinovs in the UFC, guys that are, you know, Russian killers, in my opinion, Tumanov, uh, Tysimov, um, all the mobs. <laughs> you know, uh, WSOF has done a good job, though, grabbing them up. I think Ali Abdelaziz uh, managing Nurmagomedov was able to have like somewhat of a connection with him, grab these guys in there um, who were maybe, you know, on the UFC's radar, but weren't quite developed enough. And I think that that's part of the reason too, is that, um, that, that WSOF's done a good job of snatching up some of the more talented ones. Yeah, it's kind of weird, the trend, because, you know, when Jordan Rebney was in charge with Bellator, and even, I mean, some of the guys are still around, but when he was in charge, they had a really strong Russian roster. You had your Tyler Zanarski, you had your uh, Andre Korshkov. You know, those two guys are still there, but um, some of the other guys have kind of went away from that. I don't see Coker uh, doing the, quite the international scouting that uh, Jordan Rebney did. Um, so that's kind of interesting. Uh, you know, I think like you were saying, um, they've kind of uh, gravitated more to a World Series of fighting, and it's just kind of those interesting trends you see over time. So uh, that's an interesting point to you know to look out for in the future to see where these guys end up. Our next bout, speaking of a Russian, probably the most impressive uh, performance, maybe uh, besides Martins, Albert Tumanov defeats Alan Jobain in the head kick and punch uh, there, a couple punches there, about 255 of the first round. Um, you know, Joe Bain's such a tough guy. I thought, too, I, I figured Tumanov, I favored him in the fight, but I said, Joe Bain's so tough, I don't think he'll finish him. And boy, was I wrong. Tumanov, straight killer. Wow. That's all I can say is just wow. Yeah, spectacular. I mean, that was the, uh, you know, we'll get to my number one pick for most impressive fighter um, of that card. But this was the second most impressive performance, in my opinion. Uh, you know, this was an even, a very even matchup, in my opinion on paper, I know the odds kind of lean towards Tumanoff and probably rightfully so after that, seeing that, but for him to come in there and just completely starch a guy like Joe Ban, who's tough, he's durable. We saw in the Seth Kaczynski fight a uh, uh, year, you know, 14 months ago or so that, uh, you know, he's got a chin on him, takes some heavy punches and Tumanoff put him down like, you know, just like a sack of potatoes. And, uh, you know, I'm looking and I think Tumanov is, is going to be a guy that will be ranked very shortly. I think he will be moving his way up the ladder. Um, I'm looking at possible matchups, Johnny. Is there anybody that sticks out to you? Because there's somebody that sticks out to me. Well, I think you. I think I think I know who where you're going to go with this. I honestly, I'm just thinking about this fight. Um, kind of a. a, a, a I, I think the one you're thinking of, I'll let you say that one, but I'll say this one: Patrick Cote versus Tumanov, the old veteran with the still chin of uh, Patrick Cote versus Tumanov, the up and comer. Um, I don't necessarily know if that's. Uh, you know, I think Cote is probably um, a little bit past his prime um, per se, but I think that'd be a good fight. Yeah, I mean, Cote is definitely a suggestion. Who were you thinking I was going to say? I was going to think Lorenz Larkin. Hit it right on the nose, my friend. That would be a phenomenal fight. I would love that. I think that would just be straight fireworks. Um, Both guys, uh, you know, young, um, great hands, fast, lengthy. Um, The footwork is great. I think that would be a a phenomenal. I I don't know who would win that um, fight at all. I I literally, I can't imagine who would win. I wouldn't even want to, I would not bet on that if you had a gun to my head. Um, that, That is a great fight. Now, hopefully we see it down the line. I'm, I'm assuming Tumanov's pretty fresh. I know Larkin's ready to get back in there. Um, let's make it happen. Early, early 2016. Hey, UFC 195, welterweight, all welterweight main card. Have that one open. The, there you go. Have that open the pay per view. That'd be awesome. Phenomenal. Yeah. And then our next bout. Um, obviously this one was. Uh, I don't know if we actually hit on this since our last podcast. Or, but uh, Johnny Hendricks and Tyrone Woodley was 
uh, swap, uh, was scrapped due to a weight cut mishap for Hendricks. Um, we will get on and discuss that a little bit later, but that was scrapped. So the, 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 the card was kind of switched up a little bit as far as the lineup. Um, Yair Rodriguez t- taking on Dan Hooker. Um, I thought this would be five of the night. I don't think it really lived up to my expectations, but uh, Rodriguez just really impressed me. He won by a lopsided uh, unanimous decision, uh, two thirty twenty sevens and a thirty twenty six. I thought the thirty twenty six might have been a little bit um, kind of crazy. I don't think Dan Hooker was, uh, you know, getting you know pounded almost to the part when he's getting finished at any part of the fight. Uh, he's just so tough. He showed that in the uh, Maximo Blanco fight in Japan about. I don't know, uh, about a year ago or so, but Yari Rodriguez broke his foot in the fight at the end of the, end of the, uh, when they were interviewing his foot was like a balloon, man. It was pretty gross, honestly. Um, but he showed great skill and man, he's got a bright future, Nolan. Uh, I'll, I'll play the other, the, kind of like what you did. Who do you think you want to, who do you want to pair Yari Rodriguez up with uh, next time he fights? Oh man, that's tough. I, I, you know, man, there's so many great matchups for, uh, Rodriguez. Um, there were a couple matchups that I was looking at, um, one of them, which is, uh, man, I'm blanking on it. Uh, I was thinking about maybe matching uh, Rodriguez up with uh, Dennis Seaver, maybe. Dude, I was, was, I was, I was about to say that exact same thing. Um, I couldn't remember who I was thinking, but I was, uh, yeah, I, I think that would break him into the rankings. I think it would be a good fight for both of them. Um, you know, if Seaver wants to stay relevant, he's got to fight these new up and comer, um, you know, up and comers. And it's, it's a great fight for Rodriguez, too, because he's taken on a ranked fighter who is on the decline a little bit. Um, and he could, you know, swoop in and steal that 15 slot in the featherweight division. Um, you know, I think that the thing about Rodriguez is he's, he's very good at what he does, but at the same time, he has some, you know, some, um, things that I think he could definitely tighten up. I think sometimes he lets his flashiness get the best of him. He kind of throws things that don't necessarily make sense, but they might work against lower level guys. But once he gets to the, you know, the top 15, I think guys won't, um, fall for his tricks as much. Um, you know, I think we saw it in the Rosa fight. There was a point where he threw a, like a, um, I don't even know what you'd call it. Some of his stuff so unorthodox, like kind of a, he, he faked with one kick and then he, he flew up in the air and threw his other, his other kick up. Um, and he kind of ended up on his back and, and he ended up hitting Rosa pretty hard with it. But I just think there's certain things that he puts himself in bad positions because he throws these fancy things and guys don't capitalize on him. Uh, and I think that, that, that more experienced fighters will be able to, with that being said, this kid will be ranked at some point. Um, with more, you know, with, with some more experience, I, I, I think he's bound to, to crack the top 10. I have to say this before we go to the next fight. I think he has some of the best elbows in MMA. Oh, they, they're, right. they look like they damage. They always cut the, you know, his opponent and they're just brutal, man. Right. Yeah. And the other thing that impressed me, I don't know if you saw it. Did you see the spinning back fist turn and like with the leg kick? Yeah, that was pretty awesome, man. That was, that was a really cool combo. That's, you know, that's some serious, um, uh, read and react time on that one. Yeah, that was that was a great that was yeah he's a great prospect to watch for sure. The next uh, bout was a women's bantamweight bout: Jessica I versus Juliana Pena. Um, Pena won a, a unanimous decision. There was actually a point in the, uh, the second round. Jessica I had a point deducted due to uh, like a knee, um, an illegal knee. It was kind of a controversial point. Um, I don't necessarily disagree. Uh, regardless of the scores, they're all 29-27, given uh, Pena two rounds, I won. Regardless, it wouldn't have mattered if the point was not taken. She lost the fight. Uh, Pena is a really interesting person. That's a very, uh, as far as uh, interesting uh, person in the, in the rankings, because um, she's one of the people that Rousey has not faced yet, and there's not a lot of people that can say that, really. It's, uh, you know, I feel like if with another win, she'll get that fight, honestly, and uh, I don't know if she's ready for it. I don't really know if anyone in that division is ready for Rousey. Uh, I know that's um, maybe people are a little sick of, uh, sick and tired of hearing about Rousey, but um, Pena is a good prospect to watch, and unfortunately for Jessica I, I think uh, her moment of uh, being a uh, legit contender is kind of taking the back seat. I think, I don't, I think there are several fighters in, you know, in that division that are, are better than her. Yeah, I always wonder if fighters like I, you know, they, they take fights uh you know she she took this fight on pretty short notice uh considering that she just fought in july um she didn't have much of a turnaround i think there's you know what is that three months between fights i think sometimes when fighters lose um we saw it with paul felder recently a similar scenario they take a fight um coming off a loss really fired up to get right back in there and, and just go for it again and i feel like that's not always the right move and i think that was the case here um you know pain is obviously the better fighter but sometimes I think fighters are too eager to get back in there and, and try to prove something um, rather than taking a tum- some time off and reassessing their game. I thought she didn't really show much improvement or, or you know didn't really change game plans from the Tate fight. I don't really know where she goes from here, but it's nice to see 
um, some new 135, um, you know, pound contenders with the uh, resurgence of, not a resurgence, but, um, you know, Amanda Nunez coming into the picture. Um, now, J- Juliana Pena is in that picture. I think that matchup actually makes sense. I- I'd like to see those two fight, um, you know, especially with Tate turning down the fight with Nunez, supposedly. Um, so I'm hoping that, that the 135 div- pound division, despite having such a dominant champion in Ronda Rousey, I'm, I'm hoping that they're still able to surface these contenders, um, people that, you know, it makes sense to match them up, you know, not repeat the same fighters over and over again, kind of like we have with the flyweight division where, um, you know, after we were talking about this before we went on the air, but after DJ beats Cejudo, uh, fights Cejudo or Formiga, there's really zero fights for him left. And I think Rousey still has fights for her. And that's, that's a good thing. And that's, you know, Juliana Pena is helping out, um, keeping that, that, that division viable. Yeah. Kind of, um, before we get off this fight, I kind of thought Jessica, I coming into the UFC, um, I think she's very talented, but she strikes me as someone that's kind of a small for the weight class. Obviously, um, there's no 125 pound class in the UFC, but I figured if there ever was, she'd be a perfect candidate to be one of the top contenders in it. Um, you know, an interview, she said, it's not that big a deal. She's not, you know, you know, and, and of course, she's. I don't think if fighters are gonna say, yeah, I'd be more well suited for a slider class. Obviously, they won't have confidence. But that always kind of struck me. Um, I don't necessarily know if that played a role, being you know maybe a little undersized in this fight. But regardless, uh, I'm with you, man. It's it's kind of nice to see these new blood rise in such a sh- uh, kind of I would say shallow division. Um, as we go into our next fight, speaking of Demetrius Johnson, two of the top flyweights, Joseph Benavidez versus Ali Bagutinov. Uh, Bagutinov coming off the uh, you know his first fight since his suspension. Uh, testing positive against uh, in his in his title loss to um, to Demetrius Johnson back at UFC 174. This fight honestly was not super exciting. Um, I kind of felt you know it, the fans seemed like they didn't really enjoy it. Um, and it, it obviously, it's two of the most talented flyweights. Um, Joseph Benavidez just seemed to be a step ahead of Bagutinov. Um, I think one judge gave Bagutinov a round, but it was pretty much a dominating fight for Joseph Benavidez. Kind of in a kind of in a tough spot, Nolan. He got beat, uh, knocked out by Demetrius Johnson, so uh, pretty pretty viciously actually. And that was a, a, a about two years ago, and December will be two years. I still don't think he's going to be uh, you know in that in that mix for the title shot just yet. Maybe a couple fights down the road, but it's tough, man. That division is getting you know like you said, it's getting thin. Yeah, for for sure. I mean. That's the, that's the problem you run into. Like Benavides is so good, but it's just Demetrius is so much better, um, you know. And and that I, if Demetrius decides to stay at 125, uh, if he ends up beating Cejudo or Formiga, whoever he faces at the beginning of next year, um, I think that we'll end up seeing that third match with Benavides. And I think it's you know it's something that they could promote. They can throw it as a co-main event on a pay-per-view, like they've been doing with a lot of the flyweight title fights. Um, but yeah, man, I don't know what they're going to do if, 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 uh, DJ keeps winning and he doesn't move up to 135. Uh, I think that Bagu Utinov in this fight, I do have to praise a little bit. Um, I was a little sus- suspicious of him, um, you know, failing the drug test, uh, back at UFC 174. How would he look? Um, I thought he looked a little slimmer than he, he did previously, uh, at the weigh-in. Maybe he was just, uh, you know, all out of water or whatever, but, um, yeah, man, I, I thought Bagutinov kind of proved he is an elite flyweight. Um, you know, he's not Demetrius Johnson, but he is somebody that can fall in the John Moraga, Koji Horiguchi category. Um, you know, maybe we'll see a matchup with um, with Horiguchi or I don't know, man. Uh, maybe Benavidez will get Horiguchi. Maybe that's a good fight. I don't know what you think. Yeah, I was thinking that would be a really good fight. Or, uh, you know, with with the uh, rumored uh, Russian card in 2016, we could see uh, you know maybe a co-main event between him versus Horiguchi or possibly another fight. Uh, maybe a John Moraga would be fun. I don't know if that'd be a co-main event, but that'd be a fun fight to have on the Russian card. Um, speaking of Russians, let's jump into the heavyweight bout, which uh, was a fight that was pretty interesting. Ruslan Magomedov versus Sean Jordan. Uh, Maga Madoff, obviously an up-and-coming prospect. He actually dominated this fight. Um, and honestly, I kind of felt bad. Sean Jordan took a lot of damage. Supposedly, he had a broken or injured rib going into the second round. Um, so he didn't really have much for Maga Madoff. Um, you know, a, 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 this Maga Madoff is such a, a, an interesting prospect because he's 3-0 in the UFC. But the alarming thing is he just does not does not seem to have the knockout power and it's not necessarily maybe his power, it's his fighting style. He has a very almost, I'd say like a point style fighting. He goes in there and throws punches, um, kind of backs away, throws some kicks. And he's a K1 fighter. I mean, he's fought, you know, in, in, in top tier kickboxing. Um, so it's kind of interesting. He just doesn't seem to have that knockout power. And that's alarming because once you go up to a certain extent uh, or a certain, um, you know, certain point in the, in the UFC heavyweight 
uh, you know, tier, in the top tier, you know, if you get hit with one shot, you could go, you know, if you don't have that, that's almost like fighting at a disadvantage. That's like going into, uh, you know, a battle with uh, against people with cannons, with just, you know, just, you know, guns or something like that. You know, I don't know if that's the best way to explain it, but it's kind of like he doesn't have that cannon, and I, 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 that kind of alarms me. Yeah, I don't know if you you feel the same way. Uh, yeah, it's 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 really kind of puzzling. You know, I've been mulling it over in my head, and um, I'm trying to figure out. Uh, there was a recent article written by Bloody Elbow about should Alexander Gustafson move up to heavyweight. And when I was thinking of this, I was thinking to myself that Gustafson doesn't have knockout. Like, like he's got knockout power, there's no doubt. But he doesn't have, like, in my opinion, the type of power we're used to seeing in heavyweights. And I think that's kind of similar with Maga Madoff. Um, he doesn't really have that knockout power. He's got, he can hit hard. He, I'm sure he can catch somebody and knock them out. But he's not really, like, somebody that I see as a threat to knock somebody out, which is extremely unusual in the heavyweight division. Even the fighters that are good on the ground, um, you know, Frank Mir has some serious knockout power, even though he, he's he's – mostly a ground fighter um so yeah it's kind of an interesting thing to me and, and and i like you said it kind of is a red flag to me about how far he can get but at the same time i'm kind of interested to see if he's going you know that's going to propel him and make him succeed even further because he's he's fighting guys that are are not used to um having to deal with technical strikers in the heavyweight division uh, he's pretty athletic he's lengthy he's fairly young and you know at least in the sport um so yeah i'm really interested to see uh you know he he everybody that believed he was going to win this fight um, that was like, that was his, I guarantee you, he set out, that was the type of the exact fight that he wanted to fight. Um, he, he executed his game plan perfectly. Uh, like you said, Sean Jordan, it was unfortunate, um, suffered, you know, a, a broken rib in that first round supposedly. But, um, like Jordan tweeted out after the fight, um, you know, as much as he wanted to be able to, to, um, perform better in the second and third rounds, the reason he couldn't was because of Maga Madoff. It wasn't, he, he um, you know, for some thing out of anybody's control uh that that he underperformed uh maga madoff was the reason that he was hurt so i give maga madoff all the credit in the world he deserves a ranked fighter i don't know who they're going to give him that division's pretty clogged up right now um you know especially alexi olnick's hovering in that number 15 spot and he's out until um mid july i believe of next year uh, or august uh he's having a knee surgery um so yeah, I don't know who they're gonna give him, man. I, I do you have anybody that sticks out to you that maybe you'd like to see Maga Madoff fight? You brought him up, and, and this is an interesting fight. I kind of don't know if Jufa will go this way because um, he's been such a, a guy, a loyal guy to them. Frank Mir would be an interesting fight, in my opinion, because you have Frank Mir who who is a, a, one of the most decorated heavyweights at this point in his career. He's maybe not in that top elite five or so, but he's still pretty pretty darn good. So you got a, a guy like him versus a, an up-and-comer. Uh, I don't know if Zufa wants to go that way, though. It's kind of, uh, you know, maybe Frank has a little say in who he fights. I don't know if he wants to be the prospect tester just yet, but that fight makes sense. I think Frank Mears probably ranked around the 10th or 11th heavyweight. Um, maybe, you know, you maybe even do that card in Russia. I know Frank Mir, I don't know exactly what the, uh, connection is, but I, I know he was in a couple of those, uh, Russian fight cards over the last couple of years. I remember one time him and John Jones were over there when he was training at Jackson's They were in, in Russia, I think at the, uh, I don't know, I, excuse me, I'm, I'm very, I'm sorry about this, but I don't remember the name of the promotion. It was the one that just aired on Fight Pass. Do you, do you have, you know what I'm talking about? Yeah, I do. It was a K not KSW. Yeah, it's not. Was it's it? not KSW. It's, I don't remember what it is. I think it's like Fight Time or something. It has got a generic name, right. but I think they were at the, uh, one of those shows a couple years ago. So obviously he has some type of connection to uh, Russia. Um, so that'd be an interesting fight, maybe to put on the like a headlining uh, fight in Russia. Um, like I, if people keep saying while I'm talking about Russia, is there was a, a article that came out recently that said they're eyeing Russia in 2016. They also said that in 2015. So take that with a grain of salt, but uh, we'll see how it goes. Yeah, man, I think that's a great fight. That that you know, that's the matchup I'd make uh, if you if you needed to make something uh, sooner rather than later. Uh, you know, looking at the next couple of months, if if Maga Madoff had to sit out for a while, uh, let some things figure themselves out. Um, you know, there's there's a couple fights that stick out to me. He could fight um, really either the winners or the losers of this fight of these fights. Um, uh, or at least this next one, Jared Rosholt, Stefan Struve. I think that you know he could maybe fight the loser of that um, or the winner. And then the other one that stuck out to me was maybe fight the winner of Crow Cop and Anthony Hamilton. I think Crow Cop versus Maga Madoff would be an interesting fight. Um, you know, less less so Anthony Hamilton and Maga Madoff. But, you know, we'll see how things play out. Hopefully he'll get back in there, uh, you know, early 2016. Yeah, I agree. Both those fights would be interesting, especially, you know, now I think about Stefan Struve's kind of in that same boat. He's a guy that doesn't have a ton of knockout power. Um, that would be kind of an interesting fight, you know. I, definitely, for sure, i like to see that one. Let's jump on to our co-main event of the evening. Ryan Bader, Rashad Evans. Rashad Evans coming in off of a couple years layoff. He's taking on Ryan Bader. And, man, uh, 
Ryan Bader dominated this one, man. It was, it was, uh, you know, I don't think any point in the fight I thought Rashad Evans was going to win. He, you know, he had a bad come up against the cage a couple times, throwing some pretty, pretty, you know, Rashad Evans can throw, no, no doubt about it. But uh, Ryan Bader really impressed me, and he won the unanimous decision. Um, I know, I think both of us called this fight. Nolan, uh, what'd you, what'd you like about the fight? Oh, I liked Bader's game plan from the start. I thought that the fact that he was able to outstrike Rashad, who would have thought that, uh, you know, a year ago that that Ryan Bader would be right outstriking Rashad Evans. Uh, he had great takedowns. You know, Rashad's known to have pretty good takedown defense, and, and Bader got him down a couple times. I was really impressed by this. I think it was a career-defining moment for Ryan Bader. This is the win um, that he could never achieve. He'd always get to this point, get knocked out by Machida, get knocked out by Glover, uh, get submitted by John Jones uh, You know, earlier on in his career. Uh, this was the win that he needed. I think he is in title contention. I don't think he's a joke anymore. Nobody can really criticize Ryan Bader. Um, you know, every time I see Ryan Bader get a fight announced, people are shitting on him. I don't understand why. Um, he's really propelled his game. I think training down at uh, Power MMA and Fitness, he's got some good training partners down there now. Uh, Daniel Serafian, uh, CB Dalloway. Um, he's got some, you know, some lighter weight guys that he can train with now coming over from uh, Alliance MMA. Uh, so I think it's a phenomenal uh, job by Aaron Simpson uh, helping Bader out to get to this level. And, you know, if it was me, um, depending on what, you know, obviously you have to see what John Jones is doing, but I, I would have DC and, and Bader fight, uh, you know, early in late, um, January, early February of next year. Yeah, actually, I agree with you. Who would have thought Bader outstrikes Evans? This is a signature win. Hopefully people uh, will kind of give him some respect. I know he's like you said, he's people kind of label him as the, uh, like the, you know, maybe, I wouldn't say gatekeeper, kind of like the joke, the running joke of the light heavyweight. Cause you know, he's, but I don't, I don't really understand why now like you were saying he, he showed great improvement. Um, and it was a great win. That's all I can really say. Uh, and and go, go ahead. And I, I think stylistically, the matchup with Cormier would be actually pretty interesting. Uh, a lot of people thought Phil Davis was going to out wrestle Ryan Bader, and he ended up, you know, winning winning the wrestling uh, in that in that to, in that match. And uh, you know, obviously DC uh, has the best wrestling um, that we've seen so far in the light heavyweight division, but that doesn't mean that Bader couldn't put up a good match ag- against him. I think it would be. Very, very interesting. Yeah, and the speaking of uh, light heavyweight and wrestling, let's let's jump on to our main event. We had Daniel Cormier versus Alexander Gustafson. Daniel Cormier defending his belt. Um, this is a fight I wasn't very, you know, I, I'm not saying I wasn't pumped about it, but I, my excitement level was kind of low, in the, you know, for a main event. It was kind of near the lower end of the spectrum. Um, I thought Gustafson was way over his head, and then I had to eat crow. Gustafson was in there, and uh, man, that was a great fight. You know, uh, I personally scored it. Uh, I think I gave Gustafson one round. Uh, I think it was the second. I had the third round of 10-10. Uh, that that was uh, Cormier uh, dominating most of the round, but Gustafson catching with a beautiful knee in the third and almost finishing the fight. Um, you could have really scored that either way, but I gave it a 10-10. I rarely ever give those rounds, but it was just one, you know, a tale of two, tale of two, uh, a tale of two different fighters in that one round. Um, the end was a split decision win for Daniel Cormier. Um, I personally don't know how you give the fight to Alexander Gustafson. I may have to rewatch the fight again. I haven't watched it since I first saw it live. Um, I don't know. I just, I didn't think he initially won more than one round. Um, and even I gave him a 10, 10 round, he lost the other three. Um, Nolan, did you agree with me? Did you think Gustafson won the round or won the fight? And uh, what was your overall opinion? I had Gustafson 49-46 as well. I gave him that third round. I thought the second round was pretty close. I could have seen where that would have been scored for Gustafson as well. Um, but, yeah, man, I don't know how that judge gave gave uh, Gustafson the win. I don't know what he was watching. Um, and, yeah, man, that was a great fight. Um, fight of the night for sure. Uh, I wouldn't, you know, some people are putting it in a fight of the year category. I wouldn't necessarily go that far. Um, I do think it was a great fight. It deserved fight of the night. Seeing two, he- like, really high level fighters put on that type of performance is, is always, um, you know, very satisfying and, and, and it's good to see main events live up to the hype once in a while. I thought DC looked phenomenal. Um, carrying over from a little bit from the John Jones fight. I thought DC's striking, man, very underrated. You know, everybody thinks of him as a wrestler. He's obviously got those great slams. He's good on the ground, but man, his striking is very, 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 very underrated in my opinion. And that's saying something because DC's thought of pretty highly. Yeah. That uppercuts from the clinch. That was just devastating. Beautiful. Yeah. They were awesome. And, uh, Gustafson kind of, you know, he has that reputation now of a guy that he, you know, he's maybe the fourth best, third or fourth best guy, maybe even fifth on some people's radar, but he can definitely, he, he's so game. He can go in there with the John Jones, he can go with the Cormier and really put up a great fight. Um, I kind of think, honestly, against Anthony Johnson, again, he might, I mean, I don't know, I, I, I hate playing that. Uh, obviously, Anthony Johnson has that crazy knockout power, but I kind of think Gustafson may, uh, you know, I, 
I'm not going to make any excuses for him, but being that big of a, a show, you know, in his home home country, I don't know if nerves got to him, but that was kind of seemed very kind of uncharacteristic of Gustafson to be, uh, you know, he didn't really fight. I don't think the greatest fight against Johnson. I kind of like to see a rematch of that. I don't know exactly what's going to happen. Um, and, and, and I'm with you there. I don't think it was Friday of the year. I thought it was Friday of the night, but some people were going really overboard saying this is the best. People were saying it was, like, I don't know, people, a couple people say it was better than Jones Gustafson, which I highly – uh, right. I, I yeah. disagree with that. I mean, people were comparing it, saying that it was, you know, in the same category with Rory and, and Robbie, and I don't agree with that either. Um, just just have some fun here for a minute. Mix and match. Who do, who do you pair with who in this light heavyweight division? Um, you know, it comes down to DC. Who do you give him next? Would you give him John? If John Jones is ready, say the UFC comes out tomorrow, they say, okay, John Jones reinstated. He's ready to go. Would you give Jones the next shot? Would you have Jones wait a little bit and throw Bader in there? Or what would you do? I mean, in my opinion, I'm guessing the UFC is going to go with Jones. Yeah. Um, I honestly, this is my opinion. I think the uh, UFC is going to give Jones a uh, warm-up uh, warm up fight. I don't know who exactly it's going to be. I think Bader will get the next shot. I'll tell you why I think so. This is just my opinion. Um, I think the UFC got a lot of flack over handling Jones, you know, the, the cocaine deal uh, leading up to the uh, hit and run. I think they're going to want to uh, kind of, you know, maybe backtrack a little bit and not throw Jones in there uh, quite yet. I could be mistaken. Obviously, Dana doesn't really care what a lot of media thinks. He's made that clear quite a bit. Um, so maybe they do in stadium. I'd like to see Bader Cormier maybe give Jones uh, and, you know, maybe give Jones. Uh, I'm trying to think. Who you, maybe get Jones. Rumble. Yeah, I was thinking, yeah, Anthony Johnson. Yeah, that would be a, a fun main event. You could put that on the co-main event or a main event of a car. Honestly, Jones is such a big name. Um, and then maybe do the Jones, if, if they win, you know, who knows, if they do win Cormier versus Jones 2 at UFC 200, just saying. I, I don't know that. Right, yeah, man, that's a good idea. You know, I look at that division, I think you have, um, you know, as far as elite fighters go, you have Cormier, Jones, Bader, Teixeira, Gustafson, and Rumble. Um, as far as matching those guys up, you know, I like your idea. Going into this conversation, I thought I would say that I'd like to pair up uh, – you know, um, Jones and Cormier, but I agree with you. I think that is a, that is a good idea. Um, the UFC will get a little more mileage out of John Jones, a little more mileage out of this fight with DC. Um, you know, UFC 200, if those two rematched, especially with Jones having a fight in between, maybe give a little promo after the fight and call out DC. I think it would be phenomenal. Um, you know, next scene, Bader's beating, uh, DC and, and Jones Bader's and, and UFC 200, that would be the nightmare for Dana White. But, um, yeah, man, I would put, um, I'm going way around the point here, but I, I would put uh, Cormier and uh, Bader, Jones, Rumble, and then um, you get, you're going to have to either pair up. Uh, you'd have to pair up Glover, and, and if he beats uh, Cummins with with uh, Gustafson. Yeah, interesting fights, and uh, what, what, what a bigger nightmare would be if Anthony Johnson spoiled the party. Johnson, Bader, UFC 200. I don't know if uh, I don't know if that'd be <laughs> such a hot seller, but obviously they're going to stack that card. But that was pretty much UFC 182 in a nutshell. Five of the night, Daniel Cormier versus Alexander Gustafson. Performance of the night, Tumanov and Martins. I think those are all very fair uh, awards there. I'm kind of surprised Sage Northcutt didn't get one. I guess maybe it wasn't a spectacular finish, but uh, I agree with those. Um, as we go on, there wasn't too many more fights this weekend. I just wanted to chime in on two uh, two fights I did, two uh, events I did watch. Abu Dhabi Warriors 3, this is on free, we promoted on our Facebook page a little bit, uh, it was on a, I think called EliteBoxing.tv, I never heard of the website, um, kind of thought it made one of those websites that steals my credit card information, but it wasn't, um, it was free, just you clicked on it and watched it, it was great, Nolan, I was blown away, it was, it was a lot of finishes, a lot of guys I've heard of, that's kind of the thing, you know, when you, when you go to these kind of events, a lot of times they have kind of inexperienced fighters, or, you know, regional fighters that are kind of getting, you know, over-promoted. I think 1FC does that to an extent. I know I'm going to, you know, maybe some 1FC fanboys out there are going to bash me for that, but that's kind of how I feel. This this event was awesome. Um, I'll just go over a couple of fighters. Uh, you had Max Nunez, who's a huge, a big prospect over in Europe. He won, uh, you know, with a vicious knee to the body, uh, and, and that was really impressive. Waylon Lowe, um, from, you know, World Series of Fighting in UFC, he won. Um, Carl Amasu had a really quick submission. Um, the co-main event was Alexander Shemnarski versus Jesse Ronson, who obviously Ronson was in the UFC. And Zarnowski is actually in Bellator still. Kind of interesting they took that fight. That was a fun fight. And the main event, if you get it, Nolan, I don't know if you've seen it yet or not, go on YouTube, go on, you know, MMA Reddit, go on somewhere and watch this crazy event it was bizarre it was uh probably the worst refing i've ever seen but it was so bad it, it was kind of entertaining and i hate it for sakaju because i feel like he was 
seriously knocked out four times in the event. Paul Bonatello, love it for him, 41 years old, 50th U, uh, 50th MMA fight, gets the win with a punch at three uh, at three minutes and 12 seconds in the third round. Nolan, I'm, I know I'm freaking out a little bit, but you got to watch this. They're coming back on the uh, in December for Abu Dhabi Warriors 4. I don't know anyone on the event. Paul Bonatello says he's coming back. Uh, Waylon Lowe says he's coming back, but I guarantee you will not be disappointed. It's in a ring. It's very pride-esque, very over-the-top production. It's great, man. I, I definitely check it out, guys. Yeah, I have to say, I, you know, I saw the lineup beforehand, and I was a little disappointed I didn't get to see it. A lot of times these overseas smaller promotions that live stream, you know, you can you can miss them. It's not the biggest deal in the world. Um, I never feel, uh, you know, left out because I missed it. But this actually looked pretty good, man. From what I read, it was kind of some wild stuff going on. Uh, they had some cool entrances and, and a really good production going on. So, yeah, I'm interested to see what they do at the end of the year, see if they bring in some more um, notable names. And, uh, yeah, I'll be tuning into the next one for sure and then, on your recommendation. Yeah, thank, thank you. I uh, appreciate you taking that one. And uh, Pancrase 270 was on Fight Pass. I, I didn't get to see this live. It came out at 2 a.m. Eastern Standard Time. I was in bed. I, I think I was texting Nolan at 1 o'clock saying, man, I'm going to stay up. Let's do it live. <laughs> Let's cover it live. But, obviously, I didn't. I hit the bed. Had to go to work the next day. Regardless, I watched it. Um, it was very interesting. I've, I've seen Pancrase events in the past, but usually with uh, Japanese commentary, so I was kind of confused about some stuff. They start their prelims with uh, several fights that are like, you know, K1, the timing, three rounds, three minutes. And these are kind of the more unexperienced guys, the guys starting out. They go by quick. That's actually a really good idea. I think that's a really fun idea. I don't necessarily know if I want that UFC or anyone to implement that, but for future uh, events in America, I figure that might be a kind of interesting way to do it. You know, it's not these long fights between two guys. You know, they, they really go after it. There were some fun fights. Um, and then the more, uh, you know, the, the three minute, uh, three round, uh, three five-minute round bouts, there were some also some really good fights. Uh, Victor Henry, who is a protege of Josh Barnett, he picked up the win by, I think it was a guillotine. I had to rewatch it again. I'm pretty sure it's a guillotine. He's got a lot of hype. I know Errol Hawani's tweeted about him several times, so that may be a guy to watch in the future. The main event was uh, Andy Main versus Nam Pham, both guys on Ultimate Fighter Season 12. Nam Pham was the king of Pancrase featherweight champion. He got beat by um, Andy Main. Andy Main kind of went on the record of saying he was going to uh, when he wants a shot in the UFC. I think he's 12-4-1, and one, and I don't believe he got a shot on the Ultimate Fighter finale. I think he was left off, so he wants that UFC fight. I say give it to him, Nolan. Uh, what do you think? Do you think Andy Main deserves a shot? Yeah, 100%. This was kind of a cool fight for me to watch. Uh, Tough 12 was the first ultimate fighter season that I watched intently. I watched from start to finish. It was right when I started to um, become a UFC fan. So to see these two guys who I hadn't heard much from recently, um, especially Andy Main, who was kind of, I literally, I couldn't tell you what happened to him after the show. Um, you know, I heard him on the MMA hour last week. It was, it was, it was a very interesting interview. Check that one out if you haven't heard it, but uh, yeah, man, that was, that was impressive. Uh, you know, the submission. And I think he's, he's earned a shot back in the UFC. He was a guy, like you said, didn't get a shot on that Ultimate Fighter finale. I'd love to see him back. Why not? He's got a little bit of name recognition, and it seems like he's earned it. Yeah, absolutely. Plus, uh, I don't know if you listened to the commentary uh, for the Pancreas event. There was a guy that made me sound like a, uh, uh, you know, he made me sound like I'm not Southern at all. This guy was hilarious to listen to. He sounded like a country bumpkin. He actually did a really good job, but I'm not trying to make fun of the guy. And I can't remember the other dude that was with him. He was a former fighter, I believe, back in the, uh, you know, 90s and 2000s. He did a great job. Uh, I feel unprepared. I had his name written down somewhere. I can't find it on my desk. He did a great job. I'd really like to listen to him more. Maybe they'll use him in uh, future Pancrase events or even just in the more future events they have on Fight Pass. He was great. But uh, that was pretty much it. Uh, Nolan, I'm sorry I kind of went a little long-winded on that, but I just wanted to share with you guys a couple of uh, maybe under-the-radar fights I was able to watch and I helped what I thought, th thought about the production and everything. No, man, it's, no, it, you know, it's good to, to be able to talk about uh, some of these smaller promotions, get more in-depth. I think, you know, that sometimes they're kind of swept under the rug, uh, uh, you know, who's fighting who. And a lot of times the fights were great. I, I You know, there was... Um, I believe it was was it, it was that Russian the 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 one we can't even remember the name of but the Russian fights on Fight Pass the uh, you know I tuned in obviously um, you know for the main event but I ended up the co-main event ended up being really phenomenal and you know it made me want to to watch some of these smaller shows more often I think there is a lot of high level MMA and it's it, it can produce some good some good fights uh, ones for the highlight reel but uh, moving on to our news segment um, biggest news of the week uh, was the departure of tj dillashaw from team alpha male he's moving up to colorado to train at the muscle farm headquarters gym it's exclusive for pros it's got other guys like brandon thatch drew dober i think katzengano is there sometimes 
Uh, there's a bunch of other names that I'm quite can't I can't quite remember right now. Um, they're slipping my mind, but you know that's kind of an interesting move in my opinion. Uh, a lot of people are saying that they're they're kind of uh, surprised by this. I, you know, I'm not really. I think that that this was kind of bound to happen at some point. Obviously, I don't think it's as much of a a middle finger to to alpha male as some people are making it out to be. Um, I think it's more that that uh, Dillashaw wants to train with Ludwig on a regular basis. Ludwig is going to be at the camp with Dillashaw. He's getting paid apparently to be at the Muscle Farm headquarters. He's still got some solid training partners. He's got a state-of-the-art facility. Um, he's at elevation. Um, and, and the other thing is that at some point, I'm guessing he'll have to fight Uriah Faber. So that, that gets rid of that problem. Uh, what do you think of this move, uh, Johnny? You think it's a good move, bad move, in between? Um, I'm kind of in between. Uh, I think the thing I do notice on Muscle Farm Gym, if you see on Twitter a lot, they have a, they're very, it seems like no fighters have a problem with that gym. I see uh, Stephen Thompson was up there. Uh, a couple, I mean, like last year or so, doing some training. Neil Magny, Matt Brown stops in there from time to time. Nate Marquardt, they seem like have a really uh, good working relationship with all types of different fighters. I think Clay Guida has done some of his training there as well. Um, the rumor was going around that he uh, told one of the guys, I guess, the, the I think it's Lester Bowling's up there at the Muscle Farm Gym. He told him that he was going to try to do 50, 50 or 60 percent of his training in Denver, and then the rest at Team Alpha Mel, they kind of uh, had a discussion about it, and he just jumped to the, you know, jumped to Colorado. Um, Bane Ludwig, a lot of people don't know, is he doesn't actually have like an MMA gym in Colorado. He's more of a, uh, has like a martial arts academy, but he's definitely, like you said, was going to be working with uh, TJ Dillashaw. That kills, you know, the traveling aspect of having to, you know, fly in and fly out, and, you know, it, it, it cuts that connection off, uh, you know, I, I have a lot of, you know, I'm sure they have a lot of fond memories of, uh, you know, Dillashaw at, at Team Alpha Mel, but when it comes down to it, you know, he may have to fight Faber down the road, and like you said, that eliminates that problem. I think uh, for now, I'm going to have to give it a pass. I don't know for sure. Uh, maybe we'll revisit this in a year's time and, and kind of give our opinion on it. Yeah, I'm kind of split as well. I, I look at it and I say there are definitely, I think there's, it goes both ways. I think there are some positives and negatives. I don't think that this was as fiery as an exit as some people are making it sound. You know, you got Conor McGregor tweeting that he predicted these things on the ultimate fighter or whatever. I don't think it's that it's that I think the issue is more between Ludwig and Faber. I don't think there's much of an issue between Faber and Dillashaw. Um, you know, I think obviously it's kind of an awkward situation. The media blows it so out of proportion. Um, but you know, I think that there are definite benefits. One of them, obviously he's getting paid to be there. He's making money. He's at a state of the art facility that is funded by a, you know, a large, um, energy, um, excuse me, um, fitness drink company, um, protein shakes, stuff like that, uh, training gear. And he, he's being paid by them. He's got good coaches. He's got pretty good training partners, but, the, and he's at elevation and he's with his, his main coach. But the only thing that kind of sticks out to me that might be kind of a problem is the team alpha male has so many guys that are concentrated in the same weight class. They have a lot of 135 pounders. They have a lot of 145 pounders and people can say, Oh, they, you know, he's got great training partners up at, in Colorado. And that's true. But I think it, it really helps to be from have some good solid training partners at your weight class guys that you are used to training with on a regular basis. Um, I saw some, I can't remember which MMA media member was talking about this, but they kept comparing Dillashaw to McGregor saying, well, McGregor doesn't have the best training partners. Well, McGregor's never had the best training partners. So you don't know what his, what the difference would be between the McGregor that doesn't have good training partners and the McGregor that does have great training partners. He could be a lot better. Maybe McGregor, if he did have good training partners. So to take those training partners away from Dillashaw, I don't think is going to help him in any, um, in any possible way. Uh, so that's the only really flaw that I see in this whole thing. I think it, it, it does set up for as as a fan. It sets up some very interesting matchups. I think you can you know you can fight those guys now at 135. You can fight Faber. Um, you know, I, Dodson. We're, this is the next thing we're going to talk about. But John Dodson's back in that division. So this is making the bantamweight division significantly more interesting. That now that he's got matchups. Um, you know, like I just said, John Dodson moving up to 135. What do you think of that move, Johnny? You think it was finally time? I, I definitely think it was the right I think move. it was the right move. Um, honestly, I kind of, you know, I think I actually predicted him winning. I was kind of going a little gung-ho on that prediction uh, a couple weeks ago uh, when we were doing the predictions for 191. But um, Dotson, you know, he kind of got dominated in that fight. Uh, he, he actually, you know, obviously knocked out TJ Dillashaw. Uh, I think Dillashaw's greatly improved since then. I don't know if that would be the same result now. But Dotson gets a new new lease on life. I'd kind of like to see him fight Francisco Rivera. I think that would be kind of a fun fight. Both coming off losses, um, I think Dodson might probably have kind of the same, uh, you know, same uh, knockout power and maybe put him away. But I think that'd be kind of a fun fight for, to introduce him back in the weight class. Yeah, hundred percent. I that, that's that's a phenomenal fight, and uh, yeah, there's a lot of great matchups for him at uh, at this weight class. Absolutely.
All right, so the next big um, piece of news, going to transition over to Bellator now, um, something that is near and dear to my heart. It made me kind of cringe at the, uh, at the mere announcement of this. Uh, you texted me about it. I didn't believe you. Uh, Eduardo Dantas injured, rib injury. Um, Bellator scrambled. They tried to find a replacement. Joe Warren um, was talked about as b- being the short notice replacement. That fell through. Uh, the bout was scrapped together. Dantas versus Galvao off Bellator 144. The new main event, Brandon Halsey versus Rafael Carvalho. Um, still a solid fight, but not not the level of Dantas versus um, Galvao, especially where those two fights were supposed to be back-to-back on the same card. Um, from an outsider's perspective that did not buy tickets to this and does not feel robbed <laughs> right now, Johnny, what do you think of this? Is it as big of a blow as I'm making it up to be? Um, maybe. I definitely, I definitely understand your disappointment. Um, Galvao, uh, he's kind of a guy that... Obviously, they fought back. Uh, actually, in my kind of my backyard, uh, Charlotte, North Carolina, back in 2013, um, and Dantes, it was kind of a you know he he dominated the you know it was a, I think a second round knockout. But Galvo has shown a lot of you know even he's not the youngest guy in the world, but he showed a lot of great improvement since then. He's honestly looked like a different fighter the last couple of times I've seen him. He's been more composed. He seems more like a title threat. So I think that's what made a lot of people excited for this bout. A lot of times when you have a fight like this, people aren't that excited, but. Galvo's and you know with his submission over Joe Warren to win the title, he's a guy that's kind of emerged a little bit out of the uh, you know out of that shadow of that knockout or whatnot. Um, I think uh, you know I hope we see this fight down the road because you know Dantes actually was a student of his. I don't know if you saw the first fight, but Dantes was actually in tears after he knocked him out. He was very you know kind of emotional about it, obviously rightfully so. Um, uh, I think Halsey versus Carvalho is a, a good fight, but yeah, I, I I mean I understand your disappointment and uh, hopefully we see this fight. You know it, it'd be a shame uh, Dantes. Young guy, pretty you know, pretty young, and he's he's been injured a lot. So hopefully, uh, you know, he gets healthy and we see this fight uh, in the next couple months. Yeah, I, I hopefully this fight will take place. I'm assuming you know Bellator knew this would be a big one for them, so that's why they ended up scrapping the whole bout instead of trying to force something at the last moment. Uh, build the Warren fight for later. That fight's gonna bound to happen at some point, uh, whether it be Dantas, whether it be Galvao. Those are two rematches that you know people can can. Uh, Bellator can try to get people excited for, uh, but kind of going along with this thought, do you think that that um, this is, you know, in my opinion, this is one of the few times that that Bellator um, kind of let the rest of their card go. I, I know there's still a title fight, fight between Halsey and, and um, Carvalho, but we were talking about this. Uh, you, you know, their their matchmaking kind of came back to bite them on this one. I think a lot of the people in my area that did buy tickets are, are disappointed. I think there are a fair amount of people going to um, – you know, get refunds or attempt to get refunds. But, uh, you know, these mis- this mismatches that are on the card, uh, Michael Page very, uh, is, is taking on, um, oh, his name slipped in my mind. That just tells you. Uh, what's his name, Johnny? Uh, man, I, I don't know off the top of my head. I had to look it up. <laughs> he, he's 6-3. and three. I do remember his record from right, like, for, former legacy yeah. fighter. Um, that's pretty bad. But anyway, that just, that just shows that's an example right there. And then Brendan Ward taking on Dennis Olsen in the co-main event. Um, imagine how much better that card would be before the injury and after the injury if Michael Page was fighting Brandon Ward. They're both gross underdogs, or excuse me, gross favorites in the fights, uh, fighting relative unknowns. Why not pair them up? Why wait? Yeah, I agree with you. That should be the fight to make as a fight fan. I want to see that fight. Also, the guy's name is Charlie Ontiveros, I believe is how you say it. I just looked at yeah, Charlie Ontiveros. You know, who who knows? Maybe he pulls the upset, but, it, you know, it'd be very shocking if he does. Um, I agree. Brendan Ward versus Michael Page. Hopefully that happens maybe February of next year. Hopefully if both these guys get out of this fight healthy. Uh, Dennis Olsen, I think, is more of a, uh, you know, he did better than a lot, of, a lot of people expected him to do. I still think Ward will beat him, but that fight's a little more interesting to me. Um, Ontiveros seems to be kind of outmatched. I wonder if they didn't have someone lined up for Page and it gets scrapped because it's such a weird match, to, especially to make this close to the fight. Fight, you know, um, it's right. almost like they had someone in mind there. There was just a couple, you know, maybe you know how the fight game is. Maybe there was some, you know, uh, dispute as far as, you know, the, the contract or the fight or whenever it was going to be. Regardless, uh, I agree with you, though, as far as this, this is one of the few times uh, in Bellator where the, 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 the matchmaking, uh, you know, it left a lot to be desired. If you, Even if you look back at the last fight, Warren versus Galvo, they had some solid prelims. And I think they did that just in case anything on the main card happened. They didn't really do that with this one, you know. Yeah, no, I agree completely. I, you know, I look at it and it's like we literally just saw Page and Ward fight gross mismatches on the same card in July. It was ready to go, set up completely. All the fans from, you know, being from New England, there is there are amount a fair amount of, um, you know, there are a lot of MMA fans that are casual fans. This, the, the sport hasn't been promoted as much out here. 
but they have put Michael Page and Brennan Ward on every single Mohegan Sun card um, together, and they have yet to pair them up. And I just, I saw somebody on Twitter say, oh, they want to wait a little longer to try to build them. Why? What are they, why? Why not just put them together? I don't know, man. I could go on for days, but um, anyway, moving on, another promotion, uh, another exciting uh, announcement, WSOF, an eight-man tournament, um, some great names in there, Brian Foster, um, Luis, Luis Palomino, uh, Joanne Zeffirino, there's the, you know, Mike Ricci, there's, there's a lot of great names in it. I think it's, it's a very good idea. Um, Arizona, the, uh, Arizona state athletic commission, one of the few commissions that will, uh, allow them to do an eight man one night tournament. I think it's going to be very interesting. Um, I think at a division like lightweight, I think there's a lot less, um, possibility of an injury. Uh, and even if there is, there are so many fighters that it won't stick out as much like in the Bellator fight, you know, if somebody gets injured, uh, there's a replacement right in, right into the finals. Whereas this, somebody gets hurt in the first round, you got somebody else coming in. It's not, you know, there's four other guys in that round. It's not as big of a deal. Uh, what do you think of this? Do you like the eight-man tournament? Um, you, are you excited for it? I, you know, I think WSOF, I've said it in previous podcasts, they're starting to finally get Yeah, I love WSOF. The last event was awesome. This event's even, I think, going to be better. Um, I, I gave World Series of Fighting a lot of, uh, you know, a lot of uh, 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 flack, I guess you could say, over the years. This they get it. Louis Palomino, Brian Foster, Mike Ricci, Islam Mamad, uh, I think Mamadov, Brian Cobb, uh, George Pat- uh, Patino, Yo Zeferino, and Rich uh, Petitionok, who actually fought Justin Gaethje a couple, I think it was uh, two years ago, around two years ago. Um, they're all going to be in this uh, eight man tournament. I agree, eight man tournament is awesome. Um, I'm kind of worried. Uh, I think I would like to see the reserves. Um, I kind of wonder if they're going to do uh, Jason High versus uh, Carlos Fodor as the uh, as the maybe like the uh, reserve bout. I know that fight was announced, or I think it was been talked about. Um, I, I, that would be a good reserve bout. Um, but yeah, to get back on the topic, I think it's a great one. I think this is going to be awesome. They, they returned to Arizona for, I think, the third time at the Comerica Theater. They must love it there in Phoenix. I'm excited. I don't know if you can tell. I'm, I'm, I'll, I'll definitely watch this for sure. 100%, man. And I think you look at the last, um, you know, since the Pohare Shields card, they have had... I believe there was that card, and then there's this that there was the one um, with with Branch and Holder and Gaethje and Palomino, and now there's the one coming up in Connecticut, uh, Okami Fitch. That, you know, we were talking about this before we got on the air. That card from top to bottom has a notable names: Strike Force veterans, UFC veterans, top prospects. Uh, it's a great card, and now they have this eight-man tournament, a unique idea, a fun idea, something that they're you know they're they've planned by by even going to a different state than they were originally going to go to just so that this, this type of event can take place. Um, Arizona is a hotbed for them. I think they're finally starting to put out product that people want to see. Um, and that, you know, I, I know I was a little hesitant. Um, I haven't bought my world series of fighting is coming to Connecticut. I haven't bought tickets yet because I, I knew that the last couple of times they had been here, none of the main card fights took place when, when they came to Connecticut last year, zero of the scheduled main card fights that were originally scheduled for that card took place. So to me, that's a red flag. And now they have these great cards from top to bottom. Um, they have a lot of depth where even if people get hurt, they can replace them. I think they are, they are going in the right direction. Yeah. I, 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 um, I agree with you, man. I, I don't mean to interrupt you or not, but their events are, are they're something yeah. like, there's since they're getting established, um, there's, I don't know if, I don't want to get too much into details. I don't know all the facts. I don't want to, you know, in, uh, put anyone, you know, throw them under the bus. There was a higher up in the, uh, in the company that got arrested. Uh, I think he's in jail currently. I think he's going to be there for a while. They replaced him. And since that happened, I don't know if it was maybe a uh, distraction. I'm sure it had to be there. You're doing some legal v- battles. Um, and, and that, I think since that's happened, they've kind of, uh, you know, they've, they've hired some new blood and it's, it's the, they're, uh, their events actually seem like events, not just another, uh, I might turn into it. You know, it's a, a, a you know, it's going to be the same time as UFC, you know, maybe I'll watch the main event. These actually fights are, are, are great. You know, they want the, you, you want to see this. I think they're doing it on a Friday is good too. When they, you know, a couple of times they went head to head with, uh, I believe they went head to head to UFC a couple of times. I know they went to head to head with Bellator a couple of times. You're going head to head with Bellator for that eight man yeah, turn. I, I honestly, I, I think I had to go world series of fighting. I, I don't, Me too, I think man. I had to go with that. I agree, and that upper, the executive you were talking about, the replacement um, was uh, was one of the members uh, uh, or higher up of the New York Yankees, so he's obviously been around sports. He knows what he's doing a little bit, but uh, moving on to the next topic, uh, we had some fight announcements, uh, or actually there's one more piece of news that um, kind of slipped my mind. Uh, 
some huge, devastating news to one of the best UFC fighters of all time. CM Punk has a setback. <laughs> he will, you know, shoulder injury. Um, not, I don't really know why this is even really a story. Um, I didn't, it's not really a setback when you don't even really have a fight. Um, but I think this just sets him up. UFC 200 debut of CM Punk. What do you think? I do too, man. And honestly, um, I'm a, I'm a, I'm a big pro wrestling fan. Maybe not as much as I used to be. I was a CM Punk fan, uh, a couple of years ago, you know, when his, in his time in pro wrestling, um, honestly, I don't mean it. I, I rarely ever bash somebody. I can't stand anyone. I unfollowed him. I, I don't. I can't stand this guy. Um, I'm not going to try to bash him too bad. I just, the things he said always rub me the wrong way. I, I, I want to see him smash. I guess it is. I guess it is working. I do want to see this guy get beaten to a pulp. So uh, I'm sorry. I may be going a little crazy on the mic. But I do want to see this guy get beat up. So I will pay for his fight. I think UFC 200, they put him. Maybe it's the opening fight. Maybe the second fight. Uh, he's such a big draw. He's definitely going to bring some numbers. I just don't know who you pair him with. I don't think there's anybody on the roster at 170 to 205 pounds that he has a fighting chance against. Uh, maybe I am a little biased. Obviously, I just said it. I want to see him get beaten to a pulp. <laughs> but uh, uh, I, I just don't see him beat anyone. I, so I'm, I'm kind of interested in see who they sign or who, who they pair him up against. Right, and there's a fun segment for an upcoming uh, an upcoming episode of the uh, Nebar podcast right there. Who will see him punk fight? I'm sure we'll do that down the line. <laughs> But uh, yeah, man, I completely agree. I almost don't want to see him fight on UFC 200 because I think the you know the um, 200th show in UFC history should try to exemplify what the UFC has been about. And I think this was in the history of the UFC. There's nothing that I look look at and I'm just like, kind of ashamed for the sport for doing it. Um, people criticize Bellator for putting on these free show fights, but Bellator isn't trying to pretend to be um, anything that it's not. It's trying to mix that stuff in. It, it Coker will tell you that up front. He even says that he coins it fight, fun fights versus top level talent fights. Um, and, and the UFC has always gone, uh, you know, uh, on a um, on a statement of of putting on the best fights with the best talent in the world. And by Dana White signing celebrities, um, I don't really understand um, why he would do this. You know, people try to bridge the gap between pro wrestling and UFC. I could go on for days, man. I don't think there's much correlation. I do see there's a little bit of a fan group crossover. Uh, but, man, I don't think it, it, I, it just angers me so much when people try to compare the two. Um, Ariel Hawani, I love him wrestling references on the MMA hour make me shut off his show. Um, so I, I just hopefully the UFC doesn't do something like this again. Hopefully this nightmare of CM Punk being in the UFC is over. I do want to see him lose, um, but not into fighter bashing or anything. Yeah, I, I'm <laughs> too <yeah>. late. <laughs> I just want to say one more thing. Is can you make a good point? It's kind of like, you know, yeah, you're spoiling UFC 200 because um, I, I can't remember who it was. I don't know if it was Twitter or Facebook. Someone said, this signing is comically low brow as far as it's just trying to be such a reach to get uh odd, you know a, a money grab almost to get people to, to buy the pay per view or, or attending in the show. It's kind of disgusting. Uh, I mean, I don't want to, like I said, I don't want to bash too much. I, I that would be the only fighter ever bash is CM Punk. I'm sorry, but uh, it it it's so low brow that you know it's so kind of cheesy or corny, I guess, to have him fight. And uh, Nate Diaz had that great interview from 2015 or 2014 uh, in Phoenix. He was talking about it, how, you know, you can't, you know, Stefan Shrew can't just jump over in the NBA because, you know, he's tall or whatever, you know, he, you know, and there's, you know, maybe there's NBA fans or MMA fans, vice versa, but you can't just jump over the sport. It, it, nothing else works like that. So why, why should the UFC? And uh, we we spent like six minutes talking about CL Punk. Let's go, man. Let's, let's skip it. Yeah, this is an, this is an <laughs> MMA podcast. Enough about this. Um, But moving on to the, the next part of our news segment is the uh, fight announcements. We had, you know, a fair amount of fight announcements. Um. We had uh, we talked about Michael Page's fight a little bit, um, so we're all set on that. But UFC Seoul, South Korea, uh, we had the final fight. Uh, we actually had two fights, excuse me, added to this card. Um, one of which was uh, Seho Ham versus Courtney Casey, an interesting fight between two uh, UFC um, 115, yeah, 115 pounders. Um, yeah, it's a good fight. I actually was very impressed by Courtney Casey's debut on short notice uh, in Scotland. I thought she did very well against Joanne Calderwood came out and I thought she was going to knock her out in the first minute. Um, so I'm interested to see what comes from her. Uh, CO, uh, CO ham. I can't even say it. Um, is, is, is obviously a pretty talented fighter as well. Uh, from that region going to be kind of in the hometown home area. So it'll be a fun matchup. Uh, do you have any more analysis? Um, to throw on I just said that both lost to Joanne Calderwood. Um, Casey had uh, Calderwood uh, rocked, you know, in that first round, almost finished her. Seho Ham is a very talented uh, striker. 
Uh, I do think I do think she'll be a little disadvantaged as far as power. I think Casey. I know they're one fifteeners. They're they're tiny, but I think Casey will come in with a little more power. Um, I don't know if that will play a factor. It is Seho Ham's uh, kind of home region, so maybe she gets that hometown boost and uh, takes the win. Yeah, man, I think it'll be a close one. I'm going to slightly lean towards Casey, but I'll have to think about that one a little bit more. Um, also on that card, we had an injury replacement. Uh, Elizu um, Zaleski Dos Santos uh, got injured. Um, he was supposed to fight Hyun Guy Lim. Now in his place, uh, Dominic Steele, Dom T. Steele, uh, is going to be replacing him. Steele had kind of a rough outing in his first fight against Zach Cummings. Now he's coming in to fight the beast that's Ace Lim. I think this is a tough Back to back for Mr. Steele to start off his UFC. Yeah, career. I think it's a pretty bad mismatch. Honestly, I think Steele has talent. Don't get me wrong, but I think Lim is kind of those guys for a while until his last fight um, against Neil Magny. Even Neil Magny's a top fifteen guy. I kind of figured Lim was on that verge of being a top fifteen guy. Steele is kind of your entry level uh, fighter as far you know. Don't get me wrong, he's talented, but he's kind of his, his entry into the UFC. Two back to back fights. I I think Lim takes this one pretty easily. Yeah, I do too. I think it will be a first round knockout. Um, I think, you know, Steele should try to weather the early storm because he's a local guy. I've seen him fight a couple of times. Uh, he's fought for CES. He was their champion. His game, he, he's never pretty, but he always seems to get the job done. He's kind of sloppy, um, but he always, he always gets the guys down. He's able to, he's very strong from the top. So maybe if, um, you know, Lim burns himself out a little bit in the, in the first round with some flurries that uh, Steele will be able to take him down. But I think that's kind of a gross mismatch, like you said. Um, kind of going retroactively here, uh, I forgot to mention UFC 193 got a new addition uh, to their main card. Michael Bisping, unfortunately, suffering suffering a uh, elbow injury that will put him out of action. Not for too long, just a couple of weeks, but enough where he had to pull out of his fight with uh, Robert Whitaker. In his place, the the um, the guy that's on fire right now in the middleweight division, everybody's buzzing about, finally, Uriah Hall taking another big fight on short notice, second one in a row. I give him props, man. You know, people can say whatever they want about him. I don't think that he is the uh, most exemplary, exemplary um, you know, uh, uh, person or is the best fighter of all time or has lived up to the hype so far. But I think he's getting there. And I think, you know, he's finally coming into his own. Um, and he's, he's has the right mindset. Yeah, I'm really disappointed in the news that Bisping's out. Whitaker, uh, I think this was his statement fight. Um, I kind of I honestly thought Bisping would win, but um, that's neither here nor there. I think Whitaker was ready to take the next step. Of course, Uriah Hall has a lot of height, but even if Whitaker beats him, I don't think it's that fight that pro propels him from prospect to legit contender at 185 pounds. It should be a fun fight, and I, I do... Um, you know, I've said, you know, Uriah Hall, I think he's a little overrated, but that's neither here nor there as well. I think I do commend him on taking this fight. I don't really know who I'm going to pick. I think this is a very even fight, so I think it should be fun, but I was kind of hoping Whitaker might get that, you know, Bisping fight. Maybe they make that down the road. Yeah, hopefully we see that one. Um, you know, maybe Bisping fight the winner of these two. Uh, I think this fight, I just want to say one more thing about it, is, is very interesting stylistically because I don't think Uriah Hall has had an opponent that is willing to meet him in the middle of the cage and throw. Uh, he's had Natal, who stayed on the outside. He's had John Howard, who's wanted to take him down. He's had, um, you know, the only other guy that he's really had that's willing to trade was Tiago Santos, but he was kind of on a, a lower, um, you know, he wasn't as good as he is now, first of all. And he's also, even if you were to take him, how good he is now, he's, he's, he's you know, definitely below Robert Whitaker. So I think this will be a phenomenally interesting fight. I could not pick it. Like you said, I have no idea. Um, but moving right along, continuing with our um, fight announcements for this week. UFC uh, on Fox in Orlando, or, excuse me, forgot one, UFC Vegas, the fight night, uh, December 8th, I believe, or December, what is it, December yeah, 10th, December 10th I believe. Uh, main card fight, Aljamain Sterling finally has a fight, Johnny Eduardo is, will be standing across the octagon from him, I think this is a really good fight, and it was kind of worth the wait for Sterling, uh, you know, I'm glad they didn't just throw him in uh, just to get him a fight, and I'm glad he didn't have to take a temporary leave because he wasn't getting any fights. Yeah, I think this is a good fight for Sterling. I think he'll be favored, and I think he'll take the win. Eduardo's a crafty guy with a lot of power for Bantamweight. That's the main weapon I think Sterling will have to avoid is Eduardo's hands. Of course, being from Brazil, I know this may be uh, stereotyping, but I'm sure Johnny Eduardo has a great uh, BJJ background. I don't know. I don't have his stats in front of me as far as any belt ranking or not. So there might be interesting on the grappling. Uh, exchanges as well, but I think Eduardo is really his, his big power punch. He, he knocked Eddie Wyland's uh, jaw. I think he broke his jaw with that. That's what Sterling has to look out for, but I'm, I'm favoring Sterling in this matchup, but I, I do agree. Great matchmaking. I'm glad they didn't just throw him in there with, uh, you know, just a uh, body per se, just to get him busy, you know? 
Yeah, hundred percent, man. And um, you know, just just like you said, I think Sterling will take it. I I think Eduardo's kind of a hard guy to get a, a gauge on. Um, you know, he came in, he had a big layoff, comes in, breaks Eddie Wineland's jaw, like fantastic, you know, a fantastic knockout. Really, really was hoping to see him have a quick turnaround and, and get to the mix. And you know, he's he's pretty high up in the rankings, even though he's really had only one big win in his career. So. We'll see where he um, if the lay the the second long layoff since that Wineland fight will uh, you know be a factor if he'll come in looking even better than he did in that Wineland fight. Uh, but moving right along, uh, UFC on Fox in Orlando got an addition. Uh, Randa Marcos is taking on the debuting Carolina Kowal- Kowalswicz. I don't I think that's how you pronounce it. Um, she's apparently you you were very high up on her. You know more about her than I do. Uh, Marcos finally got a fight, but this is kind of an, you know, a lose-lose situation for Randa. She's fighting somebody who apparently is very dangerous, who doesn't have that much name recognition. Um, and if she wins, she beats somebody that apparently everybody thinks she's going to beat. And if she loses, yeah, that doesn't look very yeah, good Yeah, that's the first thing that popped in my head was it's kind of a weird, uh, I don't think, I don't like this fight for her because obviously Randa Marcos is, uh, Randa Marcos is, is, higher up in this the rankings there's not a you know a ton of fights in the strawweight fights yet there's still a lot of good fresh matchups maybe to make and i think it's carolina kovalkevich i don't know if that's exactly pronounced it i'm terrible with uh, polish names she, yeah, she, she's a pretty high prospect undefeated she fought an invicta a, a while back i think it was invicta nine or ten and had a pretty impressive win um, it, it, she's, a lot of people are really, really high up on her, um, for Marcos, um, I, I may lean a little bit towards Marcos, I think she's fought tougher competition, and maybe at this point in her career is a little better fighter, but it's a tough fight, and like you said, it's a lose-lose, I think, I don't think this propels her in the top three or four of her division, and if she loses, I think it kills her momentum, um, obviously, like we were talking about, it's just kind of a small, a new division, not a ton of fighters in there. So Marcos really could be a winner two away from a, a title shot. So um, she also could be a winner, a winner two away from falling all the way down the rankings, um, if that makes sense. Uh, but I think it's a fun fight. I think it's a good match. Uh, as far as talent wise, I think they're very close. My man, I'm looking forward to that one and, and this next one. Uh, it'll probably be the bottom fight on the main card. Right now we have uh, obviously the headliner, the light. Weight title fight, uh, R- Rafael dos Anjos versus Donald Cowboy Cerrone, co-main event JDS versus Overeem, and then you got Nate Diaz and Michael Johnson. And this will probably be the fourth, the fourth fight on that main card uh, slot. Uh, it is Miles Jerry will be making his featherweight debut against Charles Dubronx Oliveira. This is a great fight. Miles Jerry's obviously been uh, criticized for being kind of boring. I think he's kind of overly criticized for that. Uh, he has had some stinkers, but he's also had some nice knockouts, some nice submissions. He finished Gomi, finished Nijum, and that was one of the most brutal knockouts I've ever seen. Um, so it's, it's, it'll be interesting to see what he does at 145. And coming in and fighting a guy like Charles Oliveira, who is exciting um, from the top game, from the back, uh, on the feet, he, he, you know, you, you, he seems to let his guard down, so you're almost thinking the other guy's going to knock him out. I think this is an exciting fight. Um, and, and it's a good matchup, Yeah, it's, man. it's, it's absolutely, it's awesome. It's kind of like uh, throwing the kid, you know, not, not to criticize Jury, but I call him a kid, but kind of throwing the kid in the deep end of the pool. Uh, Miles Jury, obviously, he's been there in the lightweight division against Cowboy Cerrone. It had been almost about a year layoff when he fights Oliveira. Um, a great fight, though. I was kind of thinking Dennis Bermuda as Miles Jury, but I actually like this one a little better. Oliveira, hopefully, uh, he's healthy. Uh, you know, he had that bizarre esophagus tear in his last fight which is was pretty disturbing honestly um but i think this is gonna be a really close fight i really don't know who i'm leaning towards i think jury i think jury might get it done man charles Oliveira is so crafty on the ground though he's one of those guys that he you know when you see him fight he really uses his jujitsu game to its maximum uh, potential he's always looking for subs he's always you know trying to put you in these awkward positions where he can catch you it, it it's going to be this one of those fights i think it's going to be probably fight of the night honestly i could see it still in the show and uh, I, I agree with you i think it's going to be the opening fight because if you look at a lot of ufc events pay-per-view or fox or even fox Sports ones it seems like they try to put a light a uh, lighter weight class to start off with. Uh, and then that seems to, because those are, you know, I guess the higher pace matches. Those kind of get people, I guess, into the show. But that's going to be a great fight. And, man, I, I can't wait to see how that one goes. Yeah, me neither, man. Like you said, Miles Jerry uh, getting a tough matchup right off the bat. And Charles Oliveira uh, moving right along. Finally, the big announcement I was waiting for, UFC's coming back to Boston. Love it. Great card. Um, it was confirmed. Uh, you know, the matchups we had talked about that were rumored. Dom Cruz and Dillashaw um, was obviously announced previously, but Alvarez and um, Eddie Alvarez versus Anthony Pettis was confirmed. Tim Boach versus Ed Herman at 205 was confirmed. We talked about both those fights, but another fight that was added in there 
um, which is, I think, is a very good matchup. If you look at the rankings, uh, there was really no other options for either one of these guys. Um, and, and, and just thinking about it stylistically, I think it's a phenomenal fight as well. Travis Brown uh, coming off his suspension um, of a couple, I don't know if it was weeks or like a month or whatever, uh, he's going to be returning to, to face Matt Mitrione. Uh, this is a really interesting fight, in my opinion. Mitrione's speed, um, his athleticism poses a very interesting threat in that division, a very unusual threat. I think he's a hard guy to emulate. Um, he always brings it, and, and, and you know he hasn't, um, hasn't made it out of the first round. I, I think I read he hasn't made it out of the first round since 2012, or, I believe, was the last time. Um, and then Travis, on the other hand, he's kind of had a, a little bit of a lull as of late. I think switching camps wasn't the best idea for him. I think his stance was kind of awkward in the last couple fights. Uh, hopefully he can he can um, make those adjustments with Edmund Tiverti and try to make it more about his game than trying to have Edmund edit things. Um, but I think this is a great fight. I'm really I'm really looking forward to seeing it live, and I don't think it will make it out of the first Yeah, I round. think it's one of those fights that, you know, Mitrion, he's, he's, he's has a lot of criticism from fans, um, you know, maybe rightfully so at times, about his, you know, maybe his talent level, his stupid decisions he makes, like the Ben Rothwell fight. But he has a, like you said, a hard style to emulate. He's very athletic, and he's a big guy. When I saw him in person, I couldn't really believe how big this guy was. You know, he's just wide and tall. Travis Brown, obviously a huge guy as well. This is like a clash of uh, two Titans, you know, going in there. I kind of, uh, you know, if I was going to pick, I think I might favor Travis Brown. But like you said, Brown had that weird, weird stance that kind of, that kind of, in my opinion, nulled his athleticism. He was always, you know, light on his feet. If he comes in with that, you know, with that same game plan, I think Mitrione might could, could take it. But I'm leaning towards Brown. But man, I'm kind of jealous you're getting to see this fight. This seems like an awesome fight to watch in person for sure. Come fly up here. Yeah, man. Absolutely, we'll man. I'll fly up there for that. That sounds like a good idea to me. <laughs> yeah, it's going to be a good one showcasing um, right after the football games on Fox Sports 1. Uh, I think that's it for uh, UFC fights, but we had two more fight announcements um, that I kind of slipped my mind as well. Um, one of them is that Chidi Njikawani is going to be making his debut at Bellator 146 against Ricky Rainey. Um, I, I don't know what you think of this fight. I think it's a pretty good matchup. Yeah, Ricky Rainey's a guy. You know, he got his, he had a little hype going into the uh, MVP fight. Um, obviously lost that, but he's, he's looked pretty impressive. Besides that, Inja Kawani's a guy that you know. I, actually, he's kind of like the almost the opposite of his brother as far as uh, he's, he's. I've heard people criticize him for having kind of boring fights, but I think he's. Uh, I don't. I think he's kind of unfairly criticized at times. I think this will probably be the opener on the uh, main card of that. It's not a not a tentpole event, more just your, your standard Bellator event. I think it's great matchmaking, and uh, they, you know they 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 need some contenders in those weight classes. So I I, I love that matchup. Yeah, it's it's very good, and I actually heard from a pretty no, no a pretty reputable source, um, a journalist from California, which will remain nameless, that uh, they originally were trying to plan Chidi Njikawani to fight Paul Daly. And I think that's kind of you know this is obviously a much better matchup. I think for Chidi, that would not have been um, necessarily the good way to start off your your Bellator career. Um, but one more fight before we go, um, I believe I saw that Timothy Elliott uh, got his next fight against Pedro yeah. Nobre. Um, that, that's that's a pretty good one in my opinion. Nobre is, is kind of notable for being uh, in the UFC. Uh, there was there was a fight he had where he um, was it against Eric Silva. Uh, no, I think it I think it was against um it, no, yeah it's, uh, Yuri point. Alcantara. He was right. That's who it was. Um, yeah, that wouldn't make any sense. But yeah, Yuri Alcantara and uh, Alcantara had elbowed him in the back of the head apparently, and Nobre went down like he was shot, and he had to get helped off by two guys carrying him. So uh, there was a little bit of um. A sour taste in his mouth uh, leaving the UFC. They, they booted him out after that one. Um, and, and you know, now he's trying to work his way back. But he, he's been a pretty talented guy throughout his career. It's too bad that that, that, that one incident defined his first stint in the UFC. Um, maybe he'll get a second one. But Timothy Elliott, I think if he wins this one, he's back in the UFC. Yeah, that'd been think? three fights. He took it in tight, on tight and in tight in FC on a pretty short notice. I mean, I think he got released around uh, mid or a little bit, maybe like right before summer of this year. And he'd had three fights, and that's a, that's a pretty impressive workload. If he wins all three, um, you know. But like you said, Pedro Nobre, people get you know people give him a lot of crap for that. You know that, and obviously you know rightfully so to an extent. But man, I don't think he has but one loss. I think that fight was a no contest. I think he only has one loss. I had to check his record. I was looking at it uh, the other day. I think he's seventeen and one. Don't quote me on that. But I'm pretty sure he's like seventeen one and one. That's a great record. He's a tough dude. This will probably be Tim Elliott's toughest fight to date in Titan. 
you know, I could see even Nobre has that controversial pass. I could see if he wins, he may get the, you know, he may get that call. He'd be a good guy to put on those Brazilian undercards. Um, I don't know for sure, but I, I think that'll be a great fight. Uh, I, I expect this event will take place, I believe they said in December for uh, Titan 36. I believe we'll see a couple fights, probably hopefully no, announced before our next podcast, because that uh, Titan always puts on pretty good shows. Titan always does it, you know, does a great job for, for um, you know, tr- trying to get these guys fights that are that are kind of veterans that, that are on the smaller circuits. Uh, I think that um, Jeff McMahon and uh, uh, Jeff, um, excuse me, um, Lex McMahon and, and Jeff Arneson do a great job of running that promotion. Uh, if you guys, uh, if Titan comes to your area, definitely go. Tickets aren't bad. They're, they're pretty cheap. You see some pretty, um, you know, good up and coming talent as well as some crafty UFC vets. So definitely check them out. Big shout out to Titan. They came to my area last December. I'm really glad that I went. Um, so yeah, man, that's going to be a good one. And I think that wraps up uh, our fight announcements for this for, for right now. I think now. that's it, man. And uh, I think uh, next week, uh, you know, they're going to have the, uh, in the uh, big press conference, I believe actually today um in japan so i don't know what the hour translation is you know but they're going to have a a lot of announcers that big uh, new year's eve japan show and we'll have them all for you next week on the mma knee bar or excuse me knee bar mma podcast ladies and gentlemen that's pretty much it for this week we don't have any big uh, notable events coming up Uh, there's a uh, you know a couple regional shows uh, you know uh, going around but nothing too big we want to jump into um, we're going to hopefully have, I know Nolan's been working, uh, you know, he's been working overtime trying to get some guests. It's, it's a lot of these fighters are really busy, but I think we got a, a couple guys lined up in the next couple weeks. Nolan, what do you, is that true? Yeah, man, we'll, we'll have a couple guests. Um, you know, I, I don't want to say who yet and I want to make sure we have it set in stone, but, uh, just follow our, our Twitter, um, at Nibar MMA Podcast, or at Nibar MMA. Right? I think our Twitter is Nibar Podcast. Our Facebook page is Nibar MMA Podcast. And we'll soon, uh, we're on our YouTube channel. Just look up Nibar Podcast on YouTube. Um, I, I know I've been a little busy. You know, both of us, uh, are, you know, go to school, have jobs, and, and are, are constantly busy, but we're still trying to make everything uploaded on our YouTube channel. I'd say in the next week you'll see uh, some of our older episodes uploaded on YouTube and some of our interviews as well. Um, I guess that's it for this week, and uh, hopefully uh, we'll be back, uh, you know, hopefully you'll check us out next week, and we're going to have a great show. I'm Johnny Brown, alongside Nolan King, signing off for this week. Have a great weekend.